Hello everyone, I'm Gayatri Mariapa. I'll be talking today about tachycardia and pregnancy, a commonly encountered scenario in all our clinical practice, albeit in the pregnancy maternity unit by the medical department or the emergency department in the community. So, cardiac deaths seems to be one of the highest concerns, not only in our country, it is still it remains the highest cause of mortality in the UK, in the recent Embrace report. It's also becoming a huge concern in, the, in America, where the maternal mortality rate has spiked to two times of the UK. And of course, the maternal cause of death out of a cardiac disease remains to be of the highest concern. So before I start, let me just present a short clinical vignette. A 36-year-old woman in her first pregnancy, sorry, in her second pregnancy, para one and now 28 weeks, is seen in her routine antenatal care follow-up. She has noted to be tachycardic at 110 beats per minute. She's otherwise well, asymptomatic. There's no fever, chest pain, dyspnea, or reduced effort tolerance. Blood pressure is 120 over 70. A resting heart rate of 110 beats per minute, which is regular, and oxygen saturations of 99% on room air. Let investigation show a normal hemoglobin of 108 grams per liter, a white cell count of 9, TSH of 1.35, an ECG done shows a sinus tachycardia. What would you do next? Would you arrange a 24 hour tape and a baseline echo for this woman? Shall we get the medical and cardiology team on board for her tachycardia? Should I just discharge the woman with reassurance? Or should I arrange another follow-up in two weeks for repeat assessment? Well, a woman who presents with palpitations or tachycardia at initial presentation. I've split the screening questions and examination findings, six and six, easier to remember. Is there associated palpitation, dizziness, syncope, fainting, or chest pain? Any pre-existing cardiac conditions? Any family history of cardiac conditions, especially sudden death? Ask about the age of the sudden death that's occurring in the family member. Her VTE risk factors? A personal history of an arrhythmia? Any signs of infection or sepsis? The six findings on examination should be on your blood pressure, her resting heart rate, her resting saturations of, of oxygen, a respiratory rate, her temperature, and a VTE risk. The screening investigations that should be done will be a full blood count to ensure she's not anemic and looking at a total white cell to see for any evidence of infection, a thyroid function test to ensure she's not thyroid toxic, inflammatory markers, the CRP and cultures, lactate, can be depending on the clinical scenario. And a simple screening cardiac test would be a 12 lead electrocardiograph. So what do we need to know about pregnancy ECG changes? There's usually a left axis deviation. There's a transient ST segment change. The Q wave in lead three in ADF. There can be inverted T wave in lead three V1, V2, and occasionally V3. A normal ECG at the time of tachycardia, meaning there's no, if there's no arrhythmia present, a pathological arrhythmia is very unlikely, especially when she presents and you have done the symptoms, uh, you have done the ECG. So, what we should do for the same lady, we can discharge her with, with reassurance as this can be purely pregnancy related. But what would you, but what we normally do is subject a woman for echocardiography, a 24 hour tape, and even monitor. But that would only be if you suspect any changes in a baseline ECG or everything else seems to be out of the norm. So an echocardiography is aimed to look for any structural heart defects 
which can be the cause for tachyarrhythmia for the woman. The 24-hour tape, it can, it's a basically a continuous recording and the duration can be up to 48 hours depending on the patient's symptoms. It'll help us to differentiate between a sinus tachycardia versus an atrial tachycardia or SVT. And also, we can pick up the ventricular ectopy burden and decide treatment accordingly. An event monitor is when you do not, it's some similar to a 24 hour tape. However, you do not record continuously, only records it when the patient activates during the symptomatic episode. So if you see the picture in which above, an echocardiography, if there's structural heart defect, similar, like an atrial abnormality, that can cause a tachyarrhythmia. And if you see down here, this is your image of a 24-hour tape. So there are many ambulatory ECG monitoring which is available in the market. You have your traditional halter that we all know. Even recorders, like I mentioned, they can be have the internal, external and internal implantable loop recorders, mobile cardiac telemetry, your cordless and wireless ECG patch monitors. Of course, now you have this, uh, what do you call a cardio, what's that called, cardiac morbid, where you just have to tap your finger on a plate to see if you're symptomatic and it will be transmitted through the, um, through the device. And of course, your Apple smartwatch in Series 4 is able to pick up a rhythm, especially atrial fibrillation. And of course, compared to an halter monitor, an Apple Watch, a halter monitor is way cheaper. So how do we differentiate between a sinus tachycardia and an SVT? So the way when you ask symptoms for the patient would be, if she presents with um, palpitations or chest tachycardia associated with it, the triggering factors, if there are anything present, you should ask, if she, you know, imagine if she has just walked. 10 flight of stairs, of course, anyone would be tachycardic, including me. So that would, it's important to be excluded. Whether it has a waxing and waning pattern, and it usually results at night. However, com contrasting to the SVT, SVT is acute. It can occur suddenly, ex even especially at rest, and it lacks the diurnal variation. Talk about the beginning and the end of the tachycardic episode. Is there speeding up and slowing down? That usually happens in sinus tachycardia. It can take minutes to hours. Whereas for SVT, it just starts abruptly and it ends suddenly. Rate variability for sinus tachycardia, the rate that changes throughout. It can speed and slow down minutes. So especially when you're checking the mother, she can be 120, she can be 110, she can be 98, and she goes up to 110. But for an SVT, there's an abrupt change from absolutely normal slow rate to a fast rate, and it stays persistently at that fast rate rhythm. So arrhythmias can be classified broadly into narrow complex and wide complex. Of course, there are other ways of classifying arrhythmias, um, looking at the drug, class of drugs, or um, arrhythmias, which depend, is it a, based on the position, whether it's paraventricular or below, uh, is uh, atrial or ventricular in origin. So narrow complex. It would be a QRS less than 120 milliseconds. So we have your SVT. In SVT, you have your regular and your irregular tachycardias. Regular will be your sinus tachycardia, your AV and RTs, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia. The irregular beats would be atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. Quite complex, you have again irregular and irregular. Regular would be a VT or your SVT, which is the apron conduction. Irregular would be a VT, atrial fibrillation with an aberrant conduction, or VF. So this summarizes arrhythmias in pregnancy, the key facts that you need to know. Most frequent arrhythmias is atrial fibrillation and paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, which occurs about 27 and 100,000 pregnancies. Who is most vulnerable would be the older women, aged beyond 41 to 50, and black women. What are the life-threatening arrhythmias? Ventricular fibrillation, which is rare, ventricular tachycardia, and atrial fibrillation, which is benign and self-limiting. That would be a sinus tachycardia, your atrial and ventricular ectopy, and your SVT exacerbations. 
which women would have sustained arrhythmias? Women with a thyroid disease which is untreated, electrolyte imbalances, or women with a structural heart disease in which tachycardias or arrhythmias worsens during pregnancy, that will be a both Parkinson-White syndrome and women with pre-existing SVT who are not medicated. So why is pregnancy an arrhythmogenic state? So as we all know to this famous diagram on my left, on the plasma volume, your heart rate, your cardiac output, stroke volume, and you're reducing your, uh, your systemic vascular resistance. So when there's an increased circulating volume, that causes your atrial and ventricle to stretch. So that causes your myocytes to stretch. So this will activate your ion channel. There'll be some early membrane depolarization, slowing conduction, and these are all within the ion channels. And this predisposes a woman to be arrhythmogenic. A larger heart can sustain re-entry. That's where you have increase of the AV re-entry phenomena because it can enter easily and there's a longer path for your re-entrant circuits. There's an increased adrenergic response and autonomic activity. So there's an increase in maternal heart rate and further this compounds the pro arrhythmic milieu. So this very nice paper done by Shotan and team about incidence of arrhythmia in normal pregnancy and its relation to palpitations, dizziness, and syncope. So this study demonstrates to how, which I explained before regarding the arrhythmogenic state, that high incidence of ectopy is normal in healthy patients presenting with symptoms, mostly palpitations, and it consists mostly of atrial premature complexes and ventricular premature complexes. The study showed that 20% had more than 10 VPCs, 12% had multiple VPCs, and 11% had tuplets. Only 10% were symptomatic during the presence of arrhythmias, but there's a significant reduction in the incidence of ectopy when this halter monitoring was repeated six weeks postpartum, which clearly demonstrates the arrhythmogenic state of pregnancy. So what's important on treatment for women with arrhythmias? This is a very nice paper by the American Heart Association. It's a scientific statement. And this was, has come about since the increase in the maternal cardiac deaths in the US. So we have the pre-pregnancy counseling, ensuring um, you have a full evaluation, you assess the uh, risk factors, medication review. During pregnancy, you monitor blood pressure, which is the specific uh, care, delivery planning, vaginal birth or C-section, decide a place of delivery, timing of delivery. A birth plan is done. Postpartum, how do you monitor her blood pressure, her cardiac condition, contraception, any modifiable risk factors. And all this is by a big cardio-obstetric team involving the obstetrician, cardiologist, the maternal fetal medicine consultant, the geneticist, anesthetist, pharmacist, and the nurse. Of course, when it comes to arrhythmias, you have the additional discussion on antiarrhythmic drugs, role of electrophysiological study, and radiofrequency catheter ablation. So it's a very nice paper, again, by the ESC, I've taken it out, regarding what are the surveillance level at time of delivery in women with arrhythmias. And if you can see over here, low-risk women, who are the low-risk, which you have the SVP, AF, Isabel, EP, your low-risk uh, LK2, long QT syndrome, your medium-risk, your unstable SVTs or VTs, and your high-risk women with the unstable VTs with structural heart disease, or your high-risk um, women with the short beauty syndrome. So based on that, they have, the ESC has recommended whether um, women based on their low risk, medium and high risk, the level and involvement of care and what we should and should not do. So low level, you can consult the cardiologist. However, when it's medium and high risk, you need to have the multidisciplinary team, including an arrhythmologist or the EP physician at the specialized center. Mode of delivery must be advised together with the aid of the obstetricians. C, cesarean delivery is usually recommended in women who are higher risk. 
and so on and so forth, all seen in the ESC guideline in pregnancy. And of course, this, this whole lecture came about um, after I was reading this very nicely uh, put article by Professor uh, Dr. Charlotte Fries on tachycardia in pregnancy, when to worry. These are all the differential diagnoses available, investigations, management. Please go online, you can find the paper, and it will tell you what we should and should what we should do and how we follow up the women. Again, this is a very nice summary by the BMJ. While using cardiovascular drugs during pregnancy, there'll be a lot of concern, not only by us, but the, our, our um, co-managing cardiologists or anesthetists. So this, what I, I mean, I've only specific because since we're talking about arrhythmias, this BMJ has nicely shown that adenosine, procanamide, flaconide, and imidacloprid. Adenosine, procanamide, and flaconide are all safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Imidacloprid is best used uh, during the breastfeeding period. Of course, there's unlimited evidence, but it appears to be safe. Again, treatment for SVT, EF, what are the acute management, long-term management, I'm not going to go on about this, but these are all obtained in the ESC guideline. Yeah. So again, okay, this very nice paper that was just released um, beginning of this year by Karishma team on SVT. What do you do for a woman on presentation, the initial assessment, what do you do for a hemodynamic unstable SVT? If the patient is stable, what do you do? The additional assessments, how you monitor the baby, you watch for weight, do you start treatment, atrial fibrillation, the flutter, rolls of beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin, procanamide, anticoagulant, very important. AVNRT, AVRTs, EP study, ablation, delivery, and who's involved in the team. And the JACC has come up with this beautiful a state-of-the-art review paper um, in January this year on arrhythmia management during pregnancy, again on SVT, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, what is it called, cardiac arrest, device management. But if you look about SVT, what we do for the acute treatment and chronic medication, first line would be your beta blockers, plus minus digoxin, but you have to make sure that there is no pre-excitation um, changes for your VT complexes. So beta blockers are not advised in such a situation. Full of ablation, or you can even defer it postpartum, but it's still safe. And of course, this is a paper done in a very, very good um, study done by just our colleagues up north from us on catheter ablation of cardiac arrhythmias in pregnancy because there's always a concern about the role of fluoroscopy during an ablation. However, it can be done with limited fluoroscopy and the outcome of the study shows, is, which was in compliance with ESC, that recommendation flawless or less uh, limited catheter ablation in drug refractory or poorly tolerated SVT at an experience center. There were 10 patients, 10 pregnancies, all showed good outcomes with an experienced operator. And of course, it's important during this uh, study, they gave prophylactic heparin to be given to prevent thromboembolic event, especially from the catheter-related thrombotic risk. So uh, a bit about uh, coming away about genetic testing for arrhythmias. There are few conditions that can have uh, genetic predisposition, long QT, Brugada syndrome, six sinus syndrome, short QT syndrome, and WP syndrome. So if you're not sure, we can always subject and women for genetic testing. And of course, this is our future in decision medicine. What do we do when you see a woman in our pre-pregnancy clinic? Counsel the risk of her condition that may pose on pregnancy, the impact for mother, mother to heart, heart to baby, the risk of thromboembolism, the risk of exacerbation of her symptoms, explain the recurrence of SVTs up to 50%, with previous atrial fibrillation, with a, um, the, the recurrence risk is 25 to 50 percent. If you have, you have to do a baseline full examination and functional assessment with your NYHA classification, your baseline resting oxygen saturations and heart rate, do a chest x-ray uh, 
or twelve-leg ECG, echocardiography, exercise testing, uh, cardiac MRI if it's indicated. Look through her medications and um, tailor accordingly. Include the role of anticoagulation, especially if a woman has atrial fibrillation. Review if she needs a radiofrequency catheter ablation. What are the fetal risks? Care when she's pregnant to inform early so that she could be under the obstetric medicine care team with the cardiologist involvement. And of course, when we're trying to review and give her proper treatment, contraception is, is essential in all cases. So coming about contraception, um, role of estrogen. And we know that being a woman is an independent risk factor for a cardiac event. Your increased risk of arrhythmias, if you heard of Tosa de Dupont, there's a risk of sudden cardiac death. Giving a woman ERT in the postmenopausal woman, studies show that there's a QT interval increment. If you take COCPs, EBCs are more frequent. So if you look over here for female and male and the ionic channels, in a female, estrogen causes a longer action potential duration, but the male is shorter. ECG have a longer QT interval and there's a and long QT induced arrhythmias based on this. So what is the role of progesterone? It shortens its op this action potential that I'm talking about and it offers some amount of protection for the woman. For contraception, again, again, this is by the FSRH UK Mac. UK Mac uh, is for for a woman who has atrial fibrillation as estrogen-based therapies, increases the risk of her developing venous thromboembolism. Any arrhythmias has the potential to cause hemodynamic instability and changes to the blood state this back to the virtuous triad. Estrogen-containing contraception or HRT needs to be very cautious with women who have transient or persistent arrhythmias as a very high risk of a thromboembolic event. So uh, this is also by DHA. There's a paper very nicely uh, summarizes about long-term implication for women with uh, cardiovascular disease. It's important her to have sustained a healthy lifestyle and undertake treatment if she wants to reduce her future cardiovascular risk. Because once you're pregnant, it just increases your lifetime risk. So any disorders of the heart in first pregnant, adverse pregnancy outcome, any pre-existing risk factors can also elevate her baseline risk of cardiovascular disease. So if all this can be modified and better control, you'll have a healthy mother and a healthy woman in years to come. So my take home messages would be, a normal ECG done during the episode of tachycardia, a pathological arrhythmia is very unlikely. It's important to have the cardio-obstetric care involvement. Catheter ablation is safe and can be done with minimal or no fluoroscopy. Electrocardioversion can be more useful than chemical cardioversion in refractory arrhythmias. We need to know what are the pathological arrhythmias, VT, VF, AFib, A flutter. Most medications are safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Remember, remember contraception in women in childbearing ages. And with that, these are my references. Thank you very much.